Hey guys, welcome to my channel. It's Jenny here and we are starting a new video lecture series on anatomy and physiology. I'm so excited to be here and I hope you're as excited to learn about anatomy as I am to be here today. So we're just going to do a brief overview of anatomy and physiology today. Some basic terminology, um, some things about structure and function to hopefully get us all started. So anatomy and physiology is arguably one of the most popular events in Science Olympiad, which is the organization I'm repping today. Um, and typically a lot of lay people use the terms anatomy and physiology kind of interchangeably because they're so intimately related, but they're not actually the same thing. So anatomy refers to the structure of the body, whereas physiology refers to the function. And structure would be physically what you see, what you can feel, um, and what things are made of. So if we take bones as an example, the structure of a bone would be like the length, what it's made of, like this calcium matrix, the proteins inside of it, um, what it actually looks like. Whereas function would be its role in the body, what it actually does. So for example, the rib cage, um, obviously that function would be to preserve the heart and lungs. Um, the skull would be to protect the brain. Uh, you know, the arms would be physical structural support for the body. So anatomy and physiology are very intricately linked. Um, they're pretty much married to one another. They always go together everywhere. But when you're talking about the fine details, anatomy and physiology don't mean the same thing. Um, so because they're so intimately related, we call this concept the principle of complementarity of structure and function. Complementarity is just a really fancy way of saying that structure and function are always going together and the structure determines the function. If you've taken any biology course, I'm sure your teacher has probably beaten this concept to death, but um, the structure of, a, um, of an organ or of a tissue will always determine what it does. So just as a very general example, um, hard tissues in the body are likely to perform a function along the lines of protection or structural support, for example, bones, whereas soft tissues probably aren't going to do a whole lot in terms of protection, but may have other functions. Um, some more specific examples of structure and function complementing each other are heart valves. So heart valves, their structure is actually little flaps of endothelial tissue um, or fibrous tissue in the heart that um, can only flap in one direction and they're actually held by these string-like structures that prevent them from flopping the other way. The significance of this is that it promotes unidirectional flow of blood. So in our body, it's really important for blood to only flow in one direction um, because your blood needs to go from your tissues back to the heart and then to the lungs to get re-oxygenated and then back to the tissues to distribute that new oxygen and nutrients elsewhere to the body. But um, if your blood were to flow in two directions, then you'd have this big mess of having oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood, and then the transport of materials would be extremely inefficient. So your heart valves are very significant in this way, and the structure promotes the function. The second concept we're going to discuss is the structural hierarchy. Um, and this is just a way that scientists break down anatomy um, into smaller components so that we can study how the more basic structures affect the organism as a whole. So there are six layers that we typically talk about in this kind of pyramidal structure, and this starts with chemical. So um, chemicals, whether they be ions or proteins or carbohydrates, are really integral to the functioning of the organism at a molecular level. And biochemists study um, the interrelationship between these molecules. From chemicals, we then move to cells, and the study of cells is known as cytology. Multiple cells of the same type form a tissue. There are four main types of tissue in the body, um, nervous tissue, endothelial tissue, connective tissue, and muscle tissue. And we'll go over these um, in a little bit more detail um, in a future lecture, but the study of tissues is known as histology. And if you type up histology labs or histology pictures on Google or something, um, you can get some pretty cool images of stained cells under microscopes, and you can see lots of very cool images, and we'll discuss those in a future lecture. Multiple tissues, so multiple cell types, um, come together to form an organ. And the minimum number of different tissue types is two, because um, just one tissue type would just be a tissue, not an organ. But the typical number of tissues for any particular organ is usually above four. 
Um, so organs you're probably pretty familiar with if you've had no experience with anatomy or physiology before. Those include like the brain, the heart, the stomach. Um, the skin is also one of the the biggest organ, in fact, in our body. Um, so those we're generally pretty familiar with. Organ systems um, are also pretty self-explanatory. Organ systems are groups of organs that come together to perform a specific unified function. So for example, the cardiovascular system's um, function throughout the body is to promote the flow of fluid um, and waste and nutrients and oxygen throughout the body, whereas the endocrine system um, has the function of secreting hormones to regulate the functions of the body. And finally, the organism as a whole. There's a little tiny picture of a human. Um, so obviously all of these components come together to form the organism, which in this case is the human. Okay, finally, we're gonna talk about homeostasis. So homeostasis is uh, quite shortly the ability of an organism to maintain a general internal balance despite external changing factors. So for example, um, if you're living in a similar place where I live, which is Ohio, <laughs> the weather is terrible. So in the summer, weather can reach up to like 90 degrees, and in the winter, um, it's often sub-freezing. Despite all these vast, drastic seasonal weather changes, our internal body temperatures stay pretty much constant throughout the year. In fact, if our temperature deviates by even so much as a few degrees, that could be life-threatening. So how does our body um, maintain this internal temperature as well as other um, internal balances despite changes in our external environment. So this is the concept of homeostasis. Um, basically, homeostasis has five major steps in any homeostatic pathway. You start with a stimulus, so that's a change in your environment, and then that stimulus is detected by a receptor. Um, the receptor gives an input to a central system, this is typically the nervous system that we're talking about, um, which affects an output that goes um, and produces a response in an effector organ. We call this an effector organ that could typically be a muscle or a gland um, or some type of organ or tissue that affects a response. So this is just the general schema of a homeostatic control mechanism and we'll discuss lots of different homeostatic control mechanisms in detail, but you can kind of see that they all have the same five-step um, kind of schematic diagram. So there are two major types of feedback control that we talk about when talking about homeostasis. The first one is negative feedback and this is by far the most popular mechanism. So negative feedback is when um, you have a stimulus and then your receptor input and output produce a response that reverses the stimulus. So you kind of come back to a midpoint um, no matter which direction you deviate. But if you have um, a metabolic pathway in which you create a set of intermediates um, from an initial reactant molecule and then you want to produce a final molecule that, um, that your goal is to produce, but then you have enough of this final molecule at the end and you don't need to produce any more. If you kept producing these intermediates in this product, you'd be having too much, which would be wasteful for the cell's um, energy and time commitment and everything. So, in fact, this final product, which I'll label here as product, would go back and inhibit one of the steps, um, typically one of the enzymes, that is necessary for this pathway. So this actually turns off the pathway and as a result less and less product is made because you have enough so you don't need to keep continuing the cycle. On the other hand, positive feedback is a little bit more rare in the body but um, it's basically the exact opposite. So whatever happens um, in the first place, the positive feedback mechanism is going to continue this snowballing mechanism and have more and more of that stimulus um, until you basically run out. So a famous example of this is blood clotting. Um, blood clotting is affected by platelets, which are um, cellular fragments in the blood that kind of stick together once you have an open wound in a blood vessel. And um, if you have a few platelets, that's not going to stop the flow of, or that's not going to stop the bleeding instantly. So instead, these platelets secrete chemicals that recruit other platelets, um, which recruit other platelets, which recruit other platelets to form a large mass um, blocking the flow of the blood from the wound at the infected site. Um, so that would be an example of a positive feedback mechanism. So you might be wondering how do positive feedback mechanisms stop? Like, 
do all of the platelets of the body eventually like converge there? Well, no. Um, obviously, the positive feedback mechanism would have to stop some other way, independent of that specific um, pathway. But that would be a different topic altogether. So today we talked about an overview of the anatomy and physiology. We discussed structure and function, the structural hierarchy of an organism, and um, some basic homeostasis. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you join me next time. Bye.